dire que c'est vraiment avec un plaisir tout à fait sincère que je viens ici. Ça me fait grand, grand plaisir de, de venir parler de mes petites obsessions favorites. Euh, je remercie Vincent de m'introduire. Bertrand, je crois, qui est un peu à l'origine de ça. Euh, Dois-je parler en anglais Should I speak English, facile Timothy Ok. All right. I will try to speak English and uh, with my uh, French accent. Ok. So, um, it is a pleasure to be there. And uh, Loup Bertex representation is uh, some kind of evolution of a very slow, long-term uh, thinking about trying to, to find the, the best method to, to show Borel some ability for quantum field theory. So, it is a, a long program on which I sort of worked for uh, all my life, essentially. But, uh, well, the, the progress is very slow. Uh, let me say that uh, one of the important problems in physics is you have often to compute the log of a partition function. I think up to now everybody would agree. And uh, what is uh, this partition function? Typically, it's uh, in mathematics, they like the generating uh, functions for things, you know, like uh, objects uh, of a mathematical nature. But physics, we add weights. For instance, if we have Feynman graphs, we want to add a weight called the amplitude. So often in physics, because uh, you have to model things, you also have weights. So le let me call Z is typically, from a mathematical point of view, a generating functional for weighted things. And log Z is usually the generating functional for the same weighting things, but with one change, that I if um, very often uh, the things are connected. For instance, uh, if Z is a partition function of a field theory, it expresses itself in terms of vacuum amplitudes of Feynman graphs. And the log Z is a series for the connected uh, vacuum graphs. Okay. I have not, uh, at, the, at this level of generality, I have not added sources and all that. It's just extremely general kind of. So then the next observation is that uh, the simplest way to check connectivity in an object is to find a spanning tree between its constituents. Because a spanning tree, by definition, is a minimal way to connect uh, constituents. Okay? But typically, you may have objects which are more complicated than trees. For instance, in classical physics, often uh, classical physics equations, because they are deterministic, they generate trees. The poincare lindstadt series is expressed in terms of trees. But when you arrive in quantum world, you do have loops. And in field theory, we do have loops. So the things like Feynman graphs, they are not trees. They are more complicated. But still, the property which tells you whether they are connected or not is uh, whether they, they contain a spanning tree. But the problem is because they have loops, they may contain many. So the next problem, uh, which you often could meet, is if there are typically many trees t in your object or your thing, uh, it's an interesting problem to wonder, should we pick a good one which is well adapted at the problem and so on. So my favorite answer to this uh, story of picking a good tree when you have several in front of you is uh, maybe uh, you should have a good forest formula. Well, uh, what I mean by that is something that was uh, explained to me a long time ago by, by my friend David Bridges. He said, if you have a good, uh, very uh, nice, very symmetric, very, very good forest formula, it should help you uh, sort of automatize the problem of finding this tree and perhaps also automatize, in general, the problem of so-called constructive theory because it's an important aspect of constructive theory. So, uh, so the f my first uh, story is to tell you, uh, to recall for you, this story about my favorite uh, forest formula, which, uh, which is uh, uh, essentially due to bridges, but we have, uh, we have developed it and used it so much with uh, Abdeselam, but it's sometimes it's sometimes called the BKAR formula. But okay, so uh, it can be seen as a way to pick a tree uh, in a, in the complete graph. You know, the complete graph is a graph with uh, an edge between every vertex. So, for instance, uh, for if you have five vertices, you know, the complete graph is this one, and uh, it's Eulerian. So normally, there is a way to draw it without taking the chalk out of the blackboard. But okay. So this is, for instance, the complete graph. It has n n minus 1 over 2 edges if it has n vertices. And then the question is, uh, suppose I have a function 
So this is kind of the KN is a maximal structure to connect things. And therefore, a nice uh, forest formula is how do you pick a uh, 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 an edge on this? Well, suppose you have a function of variables, one for every edge of the complete graph. Okay? So you have nn minus 1 over 2 variables xl. And to simplify, I will show you the forest formula in a Taylor formula, in a Taylor setting, in which the variable is from 0 to 1. And then uh, the formula can be written uh, in blue like that. The function, when this one, you see, is a bold one. That is, this one means that you know, the function is a multi-function of uh, many, many variables, n and minus 1 over 2. Okay, so for instance, here, 10 variables for n equals 5. And then uh, this one means I take all, all x, n, up to 1. So that's the point, 1, 1, 1, 1, at the very end of the cube, if you like, of all variables. And then it tells you that uh, it is equal to this, where <coughs> the sum over V, F, is over all forests of Kn. So what is a forest? A forest is an acyclic subgraph. So it is a, sub a subset of edges which don't make loops. And for instance, the empty subset is a forest. There is an interpolation parameter for every edge variable in the forest, which goes from 0 to 1. And this is a symbolic notation for this integral over all these interpolation terms. This is dw. There is here a derivative for the forest. This derivative for the forest is the simplest thing you should imagine. That is, you derive once for every edge in the forest with respect to the corresponding variable. So here and here is extremely simple. And here you find f. So you apply this. You compute this par partial derivative of f. And now the only interesting and, and non-trivial part of the forest formula is this factor, xf of the wf. So it tells you at which point you should put uh, this derivative of the function. Well, at which point? You, point, uh, you do the following. Well, you have to find the collection of all L, xl uh, f, for all edges. All edges. This means all edges of Kn. So the n and minus because this is a function of n and minus 1 over 2 edges. So you should give it for all edges. And you have a w only for the edges of the forest, which can be a, a very small subset, even empty, of the full set of edges. So to compute this xlf, it's, sim it's simple. It is the infimum of all the wl prime for l prime over the unique path joining the ends of l in f. And if no such path exists, it's 0. So it means that when you have an edge here, Well, you should look in your forest, and if your forest, for instance, is made of these three edges, then it connects the two ends of L, and the value of XLF is the infimum of the W on this object. Well, if there are no red objects, for instance, if the forest is empty, you see that all X are zero, because no such path exists. So there is an infimum there, and all the subtlety of the forest formula is this infimum. But the reason for which this formula is very beautiful is that it's a sort of canonical formula. You see, there is no choice. It looks like very mathematical. Uh, there is no preferred uh, number between these vertices. They are all equal. You know, it's democratic. And also, there is something which is that uh, the matrix between vertices made of these objects is positive. Uh, this is the same thing than to say sort of that uh, infimum functions are sometimes uh, 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 positive forms, you know, if you have, for instance, uh, inf of x and y as a kernel uh, when x belongs to 0, 1 and y belongs to 0, 1, this is a positive uh, Fredon kernel because if you want to compute sum from 0 to 1 of f of x, y, inf of x, y, sorry, f of x, f of y, And you find for the function, for instance, that this is positive, okay, dx dy. So for the same reason, sort of, this inf keeps positivity, and this is uh, very important for constructive applications. All right. So I think. Yes, you can, for instance, a typical uh, constructive application is to say that if you have a Gaussian measure between these points, 
and covariance C, and you multiply C by this factor, you still have a Gaussian positive measure, and you can measure things according to this sort of uh, interpolated measure. The keeping positivity is the essential fact for constructive application. Okay, so this, uh, the formulas, you know, uh, where you have an integral and a boundary, uh, well, it, it's, okay, I won't say anything more. Just let me show you an example. So, uh, for n equals 2, uh, if you have a complete graph on two vertices, it has just one edge. So then the functions are just of one variable, and there are two possible forests, the empty forest and the full forest made of the line. So you have two terms. And you look at the previous formula, and you see that uh, it gives you f of 1 equals f of 0 plus, an that is for the empty forest, because then I have to put to 0, plus integral for 0 to 1 of dw, f prime of w, because uh, the only link here, in this case, you know, the inf, there is only one line, and the inf is equal to w. So, uh, oh, by the way, I knew this, this formula. So I begin to believe in the for S formula, because I, I know that this is true, by the way. F of 1 is indeed F of 0. Plus. So for, for 3, it's a little bit more complicated, because uh, in N equals 3, you have a triangle. The complete graph is a triangle. Triangle, sorry. And a triangle has seven forests, because, you see, in the 2 to the 3, which is equal to 8 subsets of three lines, only one, the full subset, has a loop. All of them have no loops, they are RTP. So there are seven for S, eight minus one. And you write the formula and you find that, oh, this one was a bit is a bit more complicated by, by, than this one, so uh, it, it, it's used. But it is true. It is true for any smooth function. Well, you have to define a little bit. Uh, it has to be, for instance, uh, continuous on the boundary with, for instance, continuous right or left derivative, things like that. Anyway. So you see uh, that at the first time here appears this mean. Because uh, if you have a forest, for instance, which is made of these two lines, one and two, on this point, on this edge, you have to put the inf for the two w's, w1 and w2. So that's why oh, this inf is a mean. So this is the first time where this mean occurs. But if you go to n bigger, 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 you will find more and more of these means. Because a forest, typically on n vertices, can at most be a spanning tree. Therefore, have at most n minus 1 edges. And you have n n minus 1 over 2. So it's square. It's, it's the number of edges grows as square of n, whether the number of w's always is bounded by n. So you see that in these formulas, you will see the proportion of this orange term becoming overwhelming when n is big. So everything sort of is hidden in these orange terms. Okay? Okay, so how do you compute in practice a log with the forest formula? So suppose I come back to my problem where f is a partition function, a generating functional for weighted things. And suppose that the weights, that is often the case, they factorize over the connected components of the things. For instance, if the things are Feynman graphs, which is always what I have sort in mind, but they could be all, well, you know that the amplitudes of Feynman graphs factorize over the connected components. Then there is a simple recipe to compute log z. You start by cleverly introducing some interpolation of variables xl for the edges of the thing, sort of. Or, you know, the thing is made of constituents. For instance, uh, typically, if it is a Feynman graph, it is made of vertices, and propagators are the edges. So uh, you have to introduce variables, for instance, for the propagators, in the case of uh, the thing is made of edges and vertices. Well, the edges are the propagators. Then the idea is you apply the forest formula to f equals z, and then you get f in terms of a sum over forests. And typically, then log z is given by the same formula restricted to trees. For this miracle sort of to happen, you have to introduce cleverly the variables xl so that when x equals 0, essentially it should factorize. So you have to sort of uh, uh, introduce uh, 
the variables cleverly. But if you do it, you may have a way to compute the, the, the log of a partition function in terms of a sum of trees. So why is it interesting to compute the log of the partition function in terms of a sum of trees? It's because the trees are a, a species which do not proliferate. You know, you do have, when you have uh, an expansion in trees, there are not so many trees on n vertices. On n labeled vertices, there are at most n to the n minus 2 trees. So if you have some uh, function coming from an exponential, typically you have a 1 over n factorial of symmetry over vertices, n and minus 2 proliferation of trees, you can get a, 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 con a, con a convergent radius, wherever the, the loops, they have a combinatoric switch is much bigger. So uh, in a way, you would go back to the situation in the classical mechanics, you know, in classical mechanics, you do have the local existence theorems because uh, the Poincaré jet series is expressed in terms of trees and there are not so many trees. So let me show you an example which is a bit different from Feynman graphs. Suppose I, I have that my problem was to compute the Meyer expansion of a dilute gas with hardcore interaction. You know, if, uh, suppose, for instance, that uh, this is uh, the activity of a molecule, uh, AI, and I have n molecule, and I have this uh, 1 over n factorial. And suppose I have a perfect gas, so not this factor, then if z is this, then log z would be just the same sum, but with just one a. So it's the famous fact that you can solve for the perfect gas. But if you have a perfect gas modified with hardcore interaction, uh, if you have n molecules, you do have that every of the molecule with every other has to non-intersect. So it means you have n and minus 1 over 2 terms here, which tell you that AI must not intersect with AJ. So you know epsilon IJ is zero if they intersect, and if one, otherwise. That's called the hardcore interaction. But there are many, you know, edges, and this looks really like a problem on the complete graph, you see, because there are n and minus. So how do you compute this log? So the idea is that uh, you should compare epsilon to one, because if there was one, you would be at the perfect gas case, and you know what the log is. So you write epsilon equals one plus eta. So then eta, you see, is either 0 or minus 1. All right. Now, the idea is that if you expand this to know whether you have etas or not, so you take a product for i smaller than j of 1 plus eta, ij, and you expand. Well, if you expand fully, here you have n, n minus 1 over 2 objects. Therefore, the sum here over the subset S uh, included in the edges of the complete graph, this would have 2 to the n, n minus 1 over 2 terms. So a gigantic 2 to the n squared terms. There is absolutely no chance that it can converge with this poor 1 over n factorial in front. You know, 2 to the n squared is gigantic. So you should not do that. And the idea of the Meyer expansion is sort of, instead of expanding over the full graphs, uh, subgraphs of, uh, 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 of uh, the edges of Kn, just try to pick a tree. Because a tree would be enough to tell you uh, whether the things are connected or not by this interaction. And then you could take log z. So the idea is suppose I write epsilon equals 1 plus x ig eta ij at x ig equals 1. You see that the value x ig equals 1. I get back my interaction. So this is the clever interpolation that I mentioned just before. Suppose you now apply the forest formula. Uh, what is, uh, is it that you get? You get this, you know. Uh, this thing in front is completely uh, passive and uh, remains like it was. And this thing becomes the sum over forest. Sorry, uh, I should have written probably the same thing for z. z is exactly given by the same thing. But here you have forest. The forest formula tells you that z is the same thing with everything you see a t here, you, you think of it as an f, the sum of a forest. And then you see that the derivative, you remember there was a derivative over the forest, tells you derive for every link in the forest. So deriving for every link in the forest produces an eta factor. So you get a, produ a product for the link in the forest of the eta factor. And the remainder is given by this thing, where this is this bizarre infimum over the unique path joining I to G in the forest of the W. So you get a complicated term here, 
at a simple term here. And this is a formula for uh, the 4S. Now, you can check easily that the different connected components of the 4S factorize, because these objects are zero when you belong to different connected components. Therefore, the log of Z is exactly the same formula where you just have, it's very nice when you write a LaTeX paper, because you write a big formula with F, and you copy it and you substitute T to F, that is the formula for log Z. So it's not only easy, it's easy to write in LaTeX. So you just change the letter F to T, and that's it, log Z is computed. So why is it good? Because uh, this, you know, doesn't proliferate uh, fast because you have only n and to the n minus 2. So this keeps a fi finite radius of convergence. And now, because eta was between 0 and minus 1, 1 plus x eta is between 0 and 1. Therefore, this thing, this big horrendous thing, is bounded by 1. And this is finished. Since it is bounded by 1, this now converges, provided the activities A are small. So you see how by instead of developing all the loops by just developing a, a set of uh, a, a tree, then you can get convergence because there are not so many trees. Okay, uh, I, so then I, uh, I, I would dedicate this, uh, this little slide uh, to, to, to Michel Berger because I am going now to give you another example about a uh, sort of trees inside a Feynman graph. So I now consider another example of application of the tree formula, of the forest formula. I consider a single connected graph G, and then I can multiply uh, its amplitude, or I can, I can consider the stupid function product for all edges in G of 1, as value 1. Suppose I interpolate it. Uh, my forest formula tells me that, well, 1 is the sum for, well, the tree formula, not the forest formula. Because, uh, well, I, I could, well, the fact is I could apply this to a not connected graph. I would get a forest formula. And if I uh, si specify this formula to a connected graph, I get the following formula. One is the sum over the trees in G of a certain weight, which I called WGT. And WGT is this bizarre combination. It is a uh, uh, an integral for the product of the line in the tree of dw and this factor here. Well, it means that for any graph, not just the complete graph, I have an interesting canonical system of what I call rational barycentric tree weights. Well, why rational? We will see that these numbers are always rational. Uh, barycentric because their sum over the trees is one. So it gives you a kind of barycentric system of barycentric barycentric weights for the trees of the graph. And they have an interesting positivity property. Well, uh, because you know in a graph you have something called the complexity of the graph, which is a number of spanning trees. So you can of course find a rational system of barycentric weights by just saying to each tree I could put the weight 1 over chi. They would have all the same weight that it is not very subtle. These ones are more interesting because they hide some positivity property related to the positivity of this matrix. That's why I call them sometimes the constructive weights. So now let me show you what they are. So this is a good example. Is always uh, how do you understand the, that's the thing. So let me take this graph. You know, this graph has three vertices and four edges. And you can see that it has uh, five spanning trees. You know. There are four of them which are of this type 1, 3, 1, 4, 2, 3, 2, 4. They are a bit the same. And there is one which is a bit special. You see the 1, 2, because it, it finishes the two vertices which are a bit special here. So the, this one is a bit different from the others. So the complexity of this graph is 5. That's a determinant of its Laplacian matrix when you cross uh, 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 a line and a column. And if you compute the constructive weights, you will see that Th this one has a special weight, which is this, which is 1 over 6, because of this inch, which is squared. And this one has uh, 5 over 24. And in fact, uh, because it's 1 over 8 plus 1 over 3 minus 1 over 4, and the 4 overs are like that. So you see they are rational. And why do they add up to 1? Well, it's because 1 over 6 plus 4 times 5 over 26 is 1. That's the fact. 
So that's a fact for every graph. Every graph, if I compute my barycentric position, yeah, they will be barycentric. And now that's the place where which I dedicate especially to, to Michel Berger because uh, I learned from Michel Berger a long, long time ago, I should not say how many years ago, what is a HEP sector. So a HEP sector is a complete ordering of the edges of the graph. And uh, in uh, 1957, uh, there was a paper by a computer guy called Kruskal who says, for any HEP sector, there is a unique leading tree in the HEP sector. That is, it's a tree for which uh, the sum of uh, of positions in the ordering of the sectors of the line is minimal, so it's the best tree according to this ordering of the of the edges. So, in fact, this tree was rediscovered by Hepp and by Berger and by lots of people after that, and used for a renormalization theorem in, uh, in in field theory. So, this tree is useful to prove BPHZ renormalization theorems, and if you want to know more on that, you can just ask to, to Michel why. And it was my sp small surprise many, many years after uh, I stopped working with Michel at De Calon and so on, that uh, I find it was also related to the previous constructive weights. It's a stupid identity which I, for a long time I didn't notice, which is that the W which is obtained by the, by the forest formula that I like, this constructive formula, forest formula, is exactly equal to the proportion of HEP sectors in which the tree is living. And the proof is to, because of this mean, you know, you should decompose the W integrals according to all possible orderings of edges. And uh, I can tell you this theorem is not too difficult. So in a sense, you can understand a new way why uh, you had that this three has a weight one over six among all trees in the constructive formula. It is because it is leading in four hep sectors. You see, in fact, to get this tree, you need to have one and two in front, or two and one, and there is no other possibility. But the the one free tree is leading in five head sectors, and that's why it has five or twenty-four. This is, by the way, four or twenty-four. Okay, so this one leads in more sectors because you see that. Uh, well, of course, it leads in the sectors where you see one free in the front. But suppose that you have a three, and then you do a four. Because the four is doing a loop with three, you cannot take it. So it is also the leading three in three, four, one, two. And th that's the only one of this kind, you know. If you put here in one in front uh, and put four in after that, it's one four which is leading. So this is the only extra one which gives you that one. But there is an extra one, so it's five over 24. So it's another way to understand the barycentric constructive weights. They are also related to the choice of an optimal tree uh, in a sector. Most, the most time it, it dominates, the more weight you should give it in a tree formula. Is it one tree to ah, uh, this, uh, I am sorry. A uh, HEP sector is the following. I should have not put L1, L2, L3, L4, but 1, 2, 3, 4. So what I mean is this edge I number as 1. This one I call 2. This one I call three, and this one I call four. Okay, so suppress the L's here. So I should have written that uh, the compared to the complete graph, if I have a tree made of lines one and two, the question in which orderings of the lines will you choose this tree by the Kruskal algorithm? In fact, you choose uh, the tree in the Kruskal algorithm of the following: you look at the first line, and if it's not a self-loop, you take it. Then you sort of contract it, or you look at the next line. Does it make a loop with, with what I have chosen previously? If it makes a loop, you discard it and go to the next one. If it doesn't make a loop, you keep it. So for instance, in these four sectors, here I will choose one because it is first, then two, and I will not choose three and four. So you make loops. Here I will choose one and two. It's independent of four, three here. Here I will choose two and one. But my trees, you know, are just sets, not ordered. So I will call this the tree L1, L2. And here also the tree L1, L2. And these are the four sectors, four orderings. This, these are the ordering. I put here the first, second, third, fourth line. So a, a half sector would be ordering the four lines of this graph. So in these four ordering, the tree picked by Kruskal would be the tree 1, 2. But uh, in these five orderings, 
the tree picked by the Kruskal algorithm is going to be one free. Because if one free is in front, of course you will pick it. But also, if free is in front, four here because I cannot pick it because it would make a loop with three, and then I have one there. But if I put two, I would not pick it. So in fact, in five sectors, I would pick this one. And that's related to why I had to wait a five over 24. OK? Now, uh, my constructive dream was sort to apply a kind of general sort of combinatorial method of this kind to Feynman graphs. That is a method as general uh, and simple as the Meyer expansion. You know, if you have hardcore gas, uh, I like very much the Meyer expansion. And the bosonic field theory is especially difficult in the constructive point of view because the loops in the Feynman graphs, they create two problems. First, they create the ultraviolet divergences because you know it. It's because of loops that you have the famous perturbative divergences of quantum theory. And second, they create the proliferation of graphs faster than a factorial n. So uh, in, in, uh, in, in, um, in enumerative uh, terms, you could say that the corresponding species is not exponentially bounded at the two. So you don't have any uh, radius of convergence. But if you had uh, trees only instead of Feynman graphs, they don't create ultraviolet divergences, and they don't proliferate too fast. So if you could express the computation of field theory in terms of trees, it would be good. It might also be interesting because the trees are related to the semi-classical limit. You know. After all, uh, tree perturbation theory should be a kind of semi-classical limit. So I cannot, of course, tell you that uh, quantum field theory reduces to tree or reduces to a classical theory. That would be obviously wrong. But what I could best hope is that I could try to devise some kind of purely combinatorial formulas to sort of hide eventually these divergences as much as I can in operators which are bounded. And if the theory is good, that is, if it is stable, if it is renormalizable, for instance, if it is asymptotically free, also there, there is no reason that there shouldn't be an expansion that sort of hides the divergences, because after all, a theory of field theory which is renormalizable, asymptotically free, which is stable, should be constructible. So in a way, my goal is a, a bit the same thing that uh, David Bridges' goal told me uh, uh, 20 years ago. I would like to automatize constructive field theory because constructive field theory is too difficult. So it's, it's only a few people, a few mad people like us in the world who are doing it. If we want that it becomes a textbook subject, it has to be automatized better. Right. So a way I would uh, say conceptually, if I could uh, say that, you know, constructive theory, OK, it has some details which are a bit difficult. But conceptually, it's simple. You take an object in field theory. There is a perturbative expansion. We know if we put absolute values here, it will diverge. But suppose we could say that we would decompose it according to barycentric uh, weights, of, uh, to barycentric tree weights. It means that here, this thing that I have inserted is a function one, because it is barycentric. So I've not modified this. I've not cheated. You know. If I insert something here, which is one. Now, suppose I revert the sum by saying, because these sums now are finite. You know, a graph is finite. The number of trees in a graph is the complexity. It's finite number. Suppose I commute this. I don't do the scene of commuting functional integrals. And and vertex expansion, because that is not allowed. But this is finite, so I could commute it. And I could code the tree contribution would be the sum over all graphs which have this spanning tree of the weights times the amplitude. Now, suppose I do that. And suppose that in a certain regime, for nice theories, this thing would be infinity. This thing would be finite. I think constructive theory would be reduced to a single line and would be conceptually very simple. It would just be as simple as computing the Meyer expansion of the hardcore gas. Just pick the tree instead of showing all the loops. So that is my constructive dream since many, many years. But, and I know that this constructive dream uh, works for fermions. It works very well for fermions. Because uh, fermions sort of give you determinants. And inside a given order of perturbation theory, uh, in fact, you can. Uh, if you mix the graphs which have the common tree and then apply some sort of Hadamard or Gram inequalities for the remaining determinants, 
you realize exactly this program. But for Boson, for a long time, I was stuck because I, I thought that it would never work because uh, it cannot work for the ordinary graphical expansion of, uh, of Boson. And this is because the only source of convergence of stability for, for a stable interaction of Boson is because, for instance, the series can alternate in sign between different orders. For instance, if you have an exponential minus phi for theory, you will have a minus one to the n in front of the terms of order n. And this oscillation between orders means that you cannot use a search for a tree within the ordinary graphs of the Feynman representation because uh, if you have connected graphs, for instance, uh, if they ha have a common tree, they will have all the same order. So you will not use the alternation between different orders. So no way it can work. And I in fact, because the perturbation theory is growing very fast in bosonic, uh, in bosonic integrals, uh, you see that any program that reduces constructive theory to a single line of this type should work in another representation and this representation cannot be polynomial. The interactions cannot be polynomial because any convergent repacking should mix infinitely many Feynman graphs of the ordinary representation of different orders to take into account this, uh, this minus oscillation. All right, so uh, uh, for a while I was a bit discouraged. And uh, in fact, the I begin to focus more and more on the zero dimensional case and also on the matrix case because uh, I saw that this was a problem which had a combinatorial nature in a sense. So the solution would be to apply the idea to a different representation and I, I proposed a first solution of this problem for the quartic interaction in 2007. I called it the loop vertex expansion. But I was still not completely satisfied because it didn't work for higher order interactions. And the little progress I will show you now is that I, I have found a way to extend it to interactions of arbitrary order. So now I think it's really uh, a method which, uh, which, is, uh, which is good. So I will explain this uh, in, in a simple case of a zero dimensional theory with a complex field phi phi bar. So two, two real variables, just uh, imagine it's an integral over two variables. And I will uh, take a potential of this type with a p, which is uh, arbitrary, uh, an integer. And I will consider uh, the stable side. But of course, it's interesting also for analytic continuation eventually. And I will ask myself, how should I transform this integral into another integral for which uh, I could apply my method of uh, barycentric weights to vertices, but the vertices will be different. And the representation that I, I found is the following. Uh, well, it's just extremely simple. You can change this integral into that one, where z is, uh, well, you see, this, this is just a, a dummy variable, so this psi you could call phi. So z is minus lambda psi bar psi to the p minus 1, and tp is the fuss catalan generating functional, which satisfies the algebraic equation tp equals 1 plus z tp to the p. So it is, in fact, the, the generating functional of uh, these uh, Fuss Catalan numbers. And for p equals 2, these are the ordinary Catalan numbers. This algebraic curve is of degree 2, has two sheets only, and is the usual square root uh, solution of the Catalan function. So how do you prove how you go from there to there? Well, one, one method, there are many ways, but a method is simply to change variables from phi bar phi to psi bar psi from this. Therefore, this becomes just, this full thing becomes just this. And the Jacobian of the transformation is this. Thing. You see, it's a log because it's a determinant, because it's a Jacobian of the transformation. But now, I will not focus on this. I would like to give you a graphical interpretation of this, because I think it's even more interesting, perhaps, to have the graphical interpretation of this transformation. Okay, so first of all, no, I, I, I have a, a slide on the analytic properties. Well, it's, it, by the way, this equation for p larger than 4 has no solution uh, by, 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 by roots because, uh, you know, it's, uh, 
uh, it, it's uh, well, I, 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 I speak under the on things I don't know well, but I have asked my mathematician friends, and they told me uh, we can prove that the Galois group of this equation is not soluble, so it's not soluble by radicals for p bigger than four, and this has been proved already 20 years ago. It's not completely trivial, but this, this equation, uh, when p bigger than 4, is not soluble by radicals. But nevertheless, you can very well control its analytic properties. Because you see, uh, uh, okay, the, the fact that this thing is 1 means that they cannot vanish easily. You know, tp cannot vanish easily. Because uh, this and this, if it vanish, would not add to 1. And so you can prove that uh, you can find where this t vanishes. It's very easy also to find the asymptotic behavior of this, to compute the radius of convergence, find the singularity, prove that there are only p sheets, uh, find the asymptotic behavior of infinity. Well, we can find a lot of, of bounds and knowledge about the analytic property of this function. And for instance, uh, with very little work, I could prove the following theorem. Uh, which is that, uh, okay, this action, it is analytic except at this singularity which corresponds to the singularity which would interest uh, Bertrand, which is on the other side, okay, because uh, there is a minus sign between Z and lambda. And uh, in an open sector which avoids this singularity, for instance, I can prove that uh, all derivatives of SP not only are bounded but decay with Z. This is exactly what I need uh, to get convergence when I apply my forest formula. So the conclusion is uh, these objects, although non-polynomial and non-very explicit, they are actions, they are, if you like, vertices, which are perfectly well suited for a convergent loop vertex expansion. So uh, I, I won't tell you exactly. This is not exactly just the forest formula. It's the forest formula plus the replicatrix. But, uh, but it's exactly what is needed. If you want, I, I will tell you a little bit what a, a very simplified version of what I am saying. If I have vertices like 5, 4, the problem is that when I derive with respect to a 5, 5, 4, I get 5 cube, and this is still unbounded. You see. So when the field is large, uh, I get sort of integrands of my forest formula. You know, my forest formula will pick a tree between vertices. If these vertices are ordinary vertices, there will be sort of leaves remaining there. And they are absolutely not bounded. And so I cannot bound this thing. But if my vertices are sort of objects, which I will show you in the next slides, which are, for instance, d over d5 of log of 1 minus i5, would be 1 over 1 plus i5. And this is bounded by 1. So these not polynomial actions have the great advantage that their derivatives are bounded. And that's why uh, instead of finding them like that, you find bounded objects at the end of these things when you use this representation. That's why it will converge. Now, uh, I have still uh, 15 minutes. and. Um, Maybe I should stop here for questions, but let me, let me continue because I think the most interesting per perhaps part is the, the graphical interpretation of what are my new vertices. Because uh, after all, uh, the, graph, the Feynman graphs were useful because uh, people could think about them. We are sort of visual, you know, we, 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 we better, uh, I suppose, uh, I, at least my case, we have better intuition when we understand visually what is the thing except perhaps uh, if we are uh, uh, Russian very good in algebra, like, uh, like uh, uh, Vasily, but uh, this is not my case. So I, I, I like to have a graphical interpretation of a formula. So I would like to, to explain you what is the graphical interpretation of this guy. Okay. This guy is simple. If I expand in lambda, I have vertices, phi bar phi to the p. So two p regular vertices, and they are joined by propagators if I do the perturbation theory of that. If I do the perturbation theory of that, this is a new vertex. How should I picture it in my mind? So I should picture it like that. I, I, I also would like to relate it a little bit to a problem called the, the Galavotti formulation of classical mechanics. Uh, Galavotti considered uh, often this kind of uh, uh, non-equal integrals where you have just one phi bar and many phi's plus a source. Uh, 
Well, if you compute the z of Galavati, uh, we knew uh, since a long time that it is the sum of the oriented cycles of arbitrary length decorated with regular PR trees pointing towards the cycle. And the weights correspond to a G factor at every leaf and a lambda factor at every node. So this is the following drawing. You see, uh, if you try to, to integrate phi bar an arrow like that, with a lot of phi's here. Because there is only one phi bar, it will pick a phi of another vertex. And then you can continue, 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 until maybe sometimes you will do a, a loop. But you can see that you cannot do more than one loop. Why? Because you see, if you imagine that these things are the, the phi, or in fact the j factor, to saturate the thing, you see that you have all these arrows, and there's only one arrow which can turn in a cycle, and no other, because, uh, because the theory has only one phi bar per black vertex. So the z of this theory is just given by things which have only one loop. Why is it uh, related to classical mechanics? Well, it's because if you compute the one-point function, adding here a single phi in front, that one has no loop, is given by the trees of the poincare lynchstadt theory. If you put here, of course, classical mechanics. So, in fact, the one-point function is the poincare lynchstadt theory. But there is no normalization in classical mechanics. And, and uh, Galavotti said, OK, but uh, we should use a, a, a sort of normalization which is made of all these guys. So you don't need, because of course, normalization doesn't appear physically. But in fact, you could argue that even in classical mechanics, there are loops, but there is only one. <laughs> OK. So we can prove that this thing is exactly given by these objects. Now, suppose I take no longer the Galavotti interaction, but my full interaction, phi bar phi to the phi bar phi to the p. Well, it's a bit like the Galavotti theory with a single phi bar which can, can paint, paint in red times a bunch of p minus 1 overs which I paint in blue. Imagine that. And then imagine that I force by Dick theorem, integration by pass of only the red guys, you see that the red guys will only contract to white guys, eventually. But never to these ones, because a phi bar cannot contract to a phi bar. Therefore, this bunch of blue guys, if I force the integration of this guy, will be spectators. They will never appear. So I will get, essentially, the Galavotti theory decorated by this guy. And that's exactly what is my... Uh, Formula. My yeah, by, by choice, by decision. All these guys are the same, and I choose one, and I call it the red, and the P minus one over, I call it the blue. Now, I, I agree that this may seem a little bit mysterious, but this is by decision of the will. Okay? You paint, because in fact, fields, if you like, are labeled in big contractions. And in the yeah. You, you can, yeah, you can, if you like, you can use replicas or copies if you, if you oh, want. Okay, okay. But, yeah, okay, if you, you use replicas, one of the replicas you call the red, another is the blue, and you force contraction of the red, never contracting any blue. You will get for the red structure exactly this, but now at every vertex there is a passive bunch of blue guys which have looked at your process and not moved. And so you just put them back again. So you see the blue guys are the the new arrows which point there. So for instance here, I showed the, the theory for p equals 3. You see that for p equals 3, I had four valence vertex, three coming arrows, the five, and one outgoing arrow, the red one. Now if I put back the two blues, I will get back to my six valence vertices by adding to the previous picture exactly the missing arrows. And now this guy will be the five, this guy will be the five arrows. So this is my new vertex. I consider this the sum of all these guys with a factor 1 over q if the, if the loop is of length q to be the vertex, the vertex. And now this vertex has a nice property that no matter where <coughs> I derive it, either through a phi or through a phi bar, no matter where I hook a thing, the guy is bounded. 
if I derive there, or derive there, or derive there, this full guy, I get the derivative of SP. SP itself is not bounded. SP is the sum of all these guys. It's logarithmically growing. But derivatives of SP at any order are bounded, not only are bounded, but decay. So now, if I apply my program of rewriting the perturbation theory in terms of this is my vertex, the propagator is what it was before. I write the perturbation expansion of this. These are, I have a bunch of these vertices. Everyone is a single loop, but they all have a loop. Okay. I put a lot of these, and I search for a tree in between. I get a convergent expansion of P theory. P theory. Not a divergent one. Okay, so uh, for instance, let's now use this idea no longer on a field which is a scalar, but a matrix. The important thing is that these lines become ribbons. You know, ribbons. And the important thing on this guy is that it has two borders. You see, there is one border here and one outer border which turns around. So in terms of faces, this is a planar graph with two faces. And therefore, you should not be surprised that the formula, when you, when you apply it, uh, you, you start with, for instance, this action. You could even put here a you know, more complicated sum of objects of this kind. You have a corresponding action uh, in terms of this, uh, what I could uh, loop vertex uh, representation. So which has either operators acting on the left or on the right, it means that these structures can branch either inside or outside, either on the in inner face or on the outer face symmetrically. So this is a joint work with, uh, with Sazonov. And uh, we think with a uh, little more work, we will be able, for instance, with this kind of representation, because essentially the spectrum of these matrices is now well bounded uh, each time I derive one of these factors, we hope <coughs> that we should be able to get uniform Borel summability theorems that do not shrink in the size of the matrix for essentially any uh, completely stable matrix model with polynomial interaction. For Quartic interactions, I knew this theorem before, but I was not able to extend it uh, to, 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 to six order or more, you know. So if I now have a, a, a nice method to prove that, the next step would be to try to continue the, 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 the pleasant discussion with Bertrand, where he told me uh, I have very good methods for power series. Uh, uh, and I told him, I, I, I like to, to borrow some of the power series. Would it interest you? And he told me, yes, it would interest me. So. Hopefully, we can perhaps try to find an application which would put a bit of analytic content also in the topological recursion. I think that would be very, very nice. Uh, then I will tell you eventually if during the questions. I hope you will ask some questions. It, 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 in fact, this uh, structure by Galavotti and so on is a way to recast the Jacobian conjecture, which is a famous conjecture in mathematics. So if there is a question on this, uh, this I will perhaps comment a little bit. I have thought uh, if, uh, if this new representation has any help, I, I think probably not, but okay. But my, as you know, my, my main uh, reason of interest there is, uh, is no longer these two things. It's more uh, to try to apply this to tensor models. So I think there is a, uh, probably a rich family of applications of these ideas to tensor models. So the people who have worked recently on tensor models, I won't cite the name, but you can imagine some of them by these initials. But of course, the important initial here is a W. I will not tell you what is W. Because, okay. So uh, because of this W, uh, it, it, it is, I would say, now fashionable. But, uh, but uh, let's say that uh, W is not a constructive guy. So he always tell me I will not do constructive uh, theory. So uh, do it. So I, I think I will, do, I, do, I will do it. So let me mention that many of the most natural renormalizable tensor models have interactions of order six. For instance, the tensor model uh, found by Carosa and et al., which renormalizes the Bulatov theory, essentially, has a six order stable interaction. 
um, model that I found <coughs> with Benjeloun, and which was the first four-dimensional model, which was renormalizable, the four-dimensional tensor model, also has six interactions. So I, I am specially uh, fond of applying these models to tensor models with a method which can work not just for quartic, but also for higher order interactions, because really they appear quite naturally in tensor models. Okay, and so if you want to to know a little bit more about uh, this thing, uh, there is a seminar tomorrow. What I, 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 I will I will show you. Uh, it, it, it's supposed to be called the emergent melonic spell. Okay, so uh, that's that's. The <laughs> I, I put myself a little bit in the Games of Thrones style. So uh, I don't think this is a melon. This is probably a pumpkin, but it looks a bit like a melon. So <laughs> All right. So uh, this, this is uh, perhaps not so serious, but I, I think uh, it's just Yeah, I'm giving you the seminar. So I will stop here. <coughs> So I, I was hoping <laughs> for this question. <laughs> so uh, I always like to do some uh, some advertisement for the Jacobian problem, but with many caveats. Uh, the first caveat is that it is really mathematics. So, so since we are theoretical physicists, I, I don't know if we can really spend our life on it. The second problem is that it is a. Uh, there is a risk that if you do this full time, uh, you could become mad. So beware. But apart from that, uh, I have several mathematicians who, who told me, although the Jacobian conjecture <coughs> is not part of the uh, six or seven uh, clay problems, it is part of the 15 smale problem for the 21st century for mathematics. And several mathematicians told me, I think it's the most beautiful. It should be part of the clay program, because I think it's even more beautiful than the Riemann hypothesis. So, well, it depends on taste. But there is an advantage, uh, which is that you don't need to know what is uh, an analytic function to, to formulate it. It just tells you that if you have uh, a, a, a map from Rn to Rn, which is polynomial, you know, and whose Jacobian is 1, For any point in x, then the inverse map is also polynomial. <coughs> now, in uh, more than ten years ago, with Malek Abdesalam, we sort of uh, understood that that uh, a nice formulation of this is the following formulation. You go to the Galavotti theory. You put here vertices which are exactly the coefficient of the Jacobian matrix at every black box. And the hypothesis here is exactly that the z of this theory is 1. That is, at every fixed order, the sum of these guys, exactly the sum of these guys, is 0 everything sort of some of these guys is zero and the conclusion here is that the average of phi that is exactly the decorating tree which stops here you take this decorating tree and you push it to infinity if you sum at fixed order after a certain order it should be zero so the Jacobian conjecture can be recast as a problem of field theory of the Galavotti type uh, it is, uh, uh, if you use, this uh, smacks a little bit of supersymmetry, of plenty of notions that we like in field theory. So we thought for a while that perhaps the solution of the Jacobian conjecture could come from thinking about field theory. But uh, the problem is that what is very easy is to prove that if you have this hypothesis, the two-point function, phi, phi bar, connected two-point function, is a polynomial. That's easy. I can show it to you. Okay, examples of polynomial of Jacobian one are uh, you have to uh, 
Well, uh, yes. Uh, by the way, if n equals 1, the, the theory is proved. But to your surprise, if n equals 2, it is not proved. Even at n equals 2, the Jacobian conjecture is not proved. But for n equals 1, for instance, you can take y equals x plus, uh, I don't know, lambda x to the p, and look at the condition on the Jacobian. It tells you that 1 plus lambda p x p to the minus 1 should be always 1. It means that lambda equals 0, and then x equals y, <laughs> for inverse y equals x. But you have not learned a lot. <laughs> Now, uh, I will want give you, uh, I will discuss privately with you examples. Into. So, of course, computer search have been done. The conjecture was emitted only one century ago, so it's not uh, two centuries like the Riemann hypothesis. So that's I a risk. Ah, yes, I knew the guy, but I, I cannot. So you, you, uh, you type Jacobian conjecture in Wikipedia, and you will find the guy who, who said it. But it was emitted only in, uh, in 1920 or 30 something. So it is comparatively recent. But it is so simple because, you know, explaining what is a polynomial on n variables, of course, the most unique concept is to explain what are the, the partial derivatives of a polynomial and how do you compute the determinant out of it. But after you have done this, it's even simpler than saying that some zeros lie on an imaginary part in the complex plane because you don't need even to know complex variables at least to understand. The, the, the. So uh, it's just to say that I can prove this, but I, I cannot prove this. So my impression is that if I could relate this theory to a more symmetric theory like that one, maybe I could relate the one-point function to a certain combination of many-point functions of the theory which has more loops. And then maybe I could prove that but this is a dream. OK. And I, I cannot even advertise you to spend your life on it because it's uh, very. But uh, the conjecture has been checked by computer on many, many, many maps. So you know, uh, it's a. Sorry. Ah, they are special. Yes, certainly they are sort of. I would say they are uh, supersymmetric. If I, <laughs> I could call them the supersymmetric polynomials without any boson and fermions, uh, because they have a z which is one. <coughs> and that's supposed to hold for all n? Uh, Sorry? The, 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 the conjecture is supposed to hold for any n? A any n. So it's supposed to hold for any n. It is not proved. It is not proved. For any n, it is not proved. It is only proved in n equals 2 for homogeneous polynomial. For e y equals x plus an homogeneous polynomial, that is proven in n equals 2. And uh, in n, uh, it is also proven that if you can't prove it for any n and any Homo homogeneous polynomial of degree three, uh, four, sorry, so that derivative is of degree three, it will hold for all cases. So there are some redu reductions, but you know, you don't know if uh, uh, it reduces really or if uh, most of the work is still ahead. Let me say that also you can interpret this as the Jacobian, uh, the things which are like that are in hydrodynamics when you have transformations of a perfect weed when you con conserve volume, this max of a volume conserving map, you could also say. And volume conserving is something which is interesting in physics. So in a way, I think that this Jacobian uh, conjecture should be of interest for physicists. Uh, yes, uh, no, no. Uh, I think that, uh, why is it that physics has been focused on interactions and so on, which were polynomial? Probably because they come first after the Gaussian, you know. And, but uh, no, in fact, the main message of my talk is that in fact you should not use polynomial interactions. <laughs> theory. You should rather use complicated interactions, which are some of these guys, uh, where the vertex is already uh, contains already a lot of stru structure is And if you do that, uh, your your life will improve. You could conceptually transform constructive theory in a single line, this line. So let's hope this continues, the story will continue. <coughs>